Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's Tech Forum session. I'm Tim Middleton, Product Manager and Retailer Liaison at BookNet Canada. Welcome to New Stores, New Views, Booksellers, Adapting, Engaging, and Thriving. Before we get started, BookNet Canada acknowledges that its operations are remote and our colleagues contribute their work from the traditional territories of the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabek, the Haudenosaunee, the Wyanda, the Mi'kmaq, the Ojibwe of Fort William First Nation, the Three Fires Confederacy of First Nations, which includes the Ojibwa, the Odawa and the Potawatomi and the Mete, the original nations and peoples of the lands we now call Beaton, Brampton, Guelph, Halifax, Thunder Bay, Toronto, Vaughan, and Windsor. We encourage you to visit the nativeland.ca website to learn more about the peoples whose land you are joining from today. Moreover, BookNet endorses the calls to action from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada and supports an ongoing shift from gatekeeping to space making in the book industry. The book industry has long been an industry of gatekeeping Anyone who works at any stage of the book supply chain carries the responsibility to serve readers by publishing, promoting, and supplying works that represent the wide extent of human experiences and identities and all that complicated intersectionality. We at BookNet are committed to working with our partners in the industry as we move towards a framework that supports space making, which ensures that marginalized creators and professionals all have the opportunity to contribute work and lead. And in spirit of that acknowledgement, I confirm BookNet and my own responsibility to mend the sacred hoop with Canada's Indigenous peoples, to be an ally to all Black, Indigenous, and people of color and to unite and work alongside one another. For our webinar today, if you are having difficulties with Zoom or have any technical related questions, please put your questions in the chat or you can email techforum at booknetcanada.ca. We're providing live ASL and closed captioning for this presentation. To see the captions, please find the show subtitle button in the Zoom menu at the bottom of your screen. If during the presentation you have questions for us, please use the Q&A panel found in the bottom menu. Lastly, we'd like to remind attendees the code of conduct. Please do be kind, be inclusive, be respectful of others, including of their privacy. Be aware of your words and actions, and please report any violations to Tech Forum at booknetcanada.ca. Do not harass speakers, hosts, or attendees, or record these sessions. We have a zero tolerance policy. You can find the entire code of conduct at bnctechforum.ca forward slash code hyphen of hyphen conduct. Now, let me introduce our speakers. First, we have Chris Krachuk, who's the co-owner and founder of Little Ghost Books. Frustrated with the lack of diverse authors, on the horror shelves in most bookstores, they were inspired to create 
Canada's first horror-themed bookstore and publishing house. They are deeply invested in creating spaces in which queer and trans, POC, femme, and other folks on the margins can feel safe and connected with their community. Next is Nina Rada, who is the managing partner of Cross and Crow's Books. She is a queer settler of Lebanese and multicultural descent. While she has lived in Canada for only seven years, Nina is a veteran of both new and used bookselling with 29 years in the business. She has been a marketing specialist, an academic book sales rep, and a bookstore publicist, edited several dozen books, worked in six bookstores, and is delighted to be building community around her second neighborhood bookstore. Next, Chandler Joliff is the owner of Cedar Canoe Books. Chandler spent 10 years working in the ed tech space before making the decision to leave and open a bookstore. Cedar Canoe Books is still fairly new, having opened its doors in late 2022. And finally, Penny Warris is the co-owner and manager at Analog Books, Inc., along with her husband, Scott, Warris opened Analog Books at the end of December 2020. Previously, she had a career as a travel consultant, and Scott had an electronics distribution company. Both of them understood the dynamics of owning their own business. However, they didn't have much knowledge about the book buying world. Now that the bookstore has been open for three years, Warris feels that opening their bookstore during the pandemic was the right decision for their store. However, she would not recommend it for others. Thank you all for coming and welcome. We love you. <laughs> we love booksellers. We love new booksellers. So without any further ado, we're going to get to the questions. And our first question, a little bit softball. We're going to get you to tell us your story. You know, books, bookstores are good at selling stories. Let's hear you tell your story. What inspired you to become an independent bookseller? Were there steps you took to become more knowledgeable about the publishing industry? And how has your vision for your store evolved? Penny, we're going to start with you because your store has been around the longest. <laughs> Wow, that's not that's not usually the case when I'm <laughs> sellers. <laughs> so we actually entered into this as a business idea. We looked at um, both Scott and I were at a point in our life where we were looking for something different, and we looked at our uh, we like to say time, treasure, and talents, and looked at what um, what a company that the two of us could work together on would work. And we were really fascinated with watching the rise of independent bookstores since when they all sort of closed in 2008, when they, uh, we started to see a, a resurgence of them in, in um, like around 2015, 2016. Um, in 2017, we actually drove across the country and stopped at a lot of independent bookstores and asked them, uh, like, what would you think of opening a bookstore now? And they all said that we were nuts. And that, uh, uh, but if there was ever a time, it was probably now. So uh, we worked on that for a few years and just ended up uh, opening uh, during the pandemic. That wasn't, it wasn't a response to the pandemic. It just um, happened that our, our timing worked out. And, and like I said, in our case, um, it was perfect timing. When we opened the, um, the in Lethbridge, there's 100,000 people. There's a university, a college. Um, there's a chapters. So we, that was one of the reasons that we chose this town was because it didn't have an independent bookstore and it's two hours away from the closest independent bookstore. So um, for us, when we opened, uh, the university was closed, the college was closed, the library was closed. Um, so we were the only game in town. So it actually was, was good timing for us. We've seen huge support from the university college and, and the schools. And um, yeah, and, and we're in a, a, uh, an area downtown that we thought we could, um, we, we could use the location um, to pull in from all the other anchors on town, all the, the cool restaurants and the tattoo shops and the hairdressers and the gym and all those things that closed. 
So when we opened, we actually became the anchor of our street. So it's been, um, the, whole, the whole situation's been upside down, but perfect for us. Thanks, sounds like book selling. Upside down, but perfect. Uh, let's, uh, Nina, I'm gonna go with you. Just, I'm going to order my screen here and I have Nina up. Let's Hi. hear your. Um, so I got into book selling by getting a job. My first book job was at Powell's when they were doing heavy, heavy hiring for um, for labeling that monstrous collection, getting it all online back in the mid 90s. And it was it was like a school for booksellers at the time. And they really encouraged us to develop skills and advance and climb the compensation grid. And so they made it uh, both interesting and worthwhile to, to follow. I had never realized that book selling was a career possibility or a thing other than maybe working in a mall bookstore until that point. And that was when I encountered people who had worked in bookstores for decades, people who had worked for Walter Powell and got this, this image of, of a possibility. And I also saw people moving from book selling into other parts of the book trade. So it, it, looked, it looked like a real thing rather than a stepping stone moment passing thing. Yeah, I, try to, I try to give a little hint of that experience whenever I have the opportunity to have staff, you know, to kind of encourage them in a direction like that. Thank you. It is like that. You don't know you're choosing a career when you choose a book selling job. <laughs> Let it be known. Chris, let's hear you. Oh, oh goodness. Uh, <laughs> uh, so Little Ghost Books um, was a dream of a frustrated horror nerd. Um, I I love books. I love bookstores. Um, I owned a comic book store for almost a decade. Uh, and what I read outside of comic books is mostly horror. Um, lucky to live in Toronto, lucky to have so many independent bookstores that I love and frequent uh, who struggled to match my reading list with something from their shelves. Um, so during the pandemic, I uh, lost my mind, maybe. And uh, uh, there was the unique opportunity to have a retail space in areas of Toronto that aren't normally unoccupied. Um, so I decided I was only going to take the risk if we found the perfect space. Um, and we found the perfect space near Trinity Bellwoods Park in Toronto. Um, so close by other independent bookstores that I love um, with big windows and great display windows and natural light and old beautiful floors and I decided to build an enormous black on black bookshelf with a sliding ladder and have all of the horror I could possibly imagine on the shelves uh, <laughs> And it's worked well for us to be so niche in a neighborhood that has so many other bookstores in it. Um, and then we have expanded to publishing this year basically because I continue to have more ideas in my brain than, uh, than maybe good sense. <laughs> Chris, one question I didn't ask uh, when we met earlier. Do you still have the comic book? Store. I do. So the sidekick still exists on the east end of Toronto um, near Leslieville. Um, yeah. Cool. I'm just two genre bookstores in a trench coat. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good tag. Uh, Chandler. Oh, oh, okay. My screen shift. You went up there now. Okay. Chandler. Yeah. Uh, so like lots of folks, I came to book selling in a bit of an odd way. Um, I was in a very different career two years ago. And in Huntsville, which is where our store is and I live, uh, we had a Kohl's. It closed just over two years ago. Uh, and I was 
off one week taking a little staycation and my wife and I were walking downtown and noticed an empty storefront and I looked it up and I thought man this place would make a cool bookstore because we don't have a bookstore that was on a Wednesday on Sunday that same week um we decided that that's what I was going to do. And my wife was supportive. And on Monday, I quit my job. And we opened uh, three months after that. So um, I don't know, this is one of those cases where I think ignorance was bliss a little bit. Um, I did the opposite of Penny, which was not a tour of other bookstores. It was like, virtually no research. And then I kind of just figured I'd be able to figure it out at some point. Uh, And it's been great. Yeah, no, no regrets, despite uh, the huge learning curve. It's been fantastic. Very nice. Um, ignorance is bliss indeed. Uh, <laughs> um, so our, our next question is sort of about your experience early on, maybe as time has progressed. And we just want to see, are there any innovative marketing experiments or collaborative campaigns that you've been involved with, with publishers, local businesses, other retailers, anyone else? So any stories you have around uh, uh, these types of experiments? And who gets to go first? Penny. So for us, what we found is rather than spending our advertising budget on traditional advertising, uh, paper, um, radio, even um, Facebook or or, uh, social media, we actually have uh, set out a budget and we decide to spend that budget on fundraisers um, for the community. So one of the big, biggest marketing things we have that was a total fluke is we have a uh, bookstore cat. His name is Hugo. Um, he's definitely the most famous cat in Lethbridge and everyone comes to visit our cat and buys a book after they visit the cat but they like literally people come in and say oh I'm just here for Hugo and we're like yeah we get it but um, so as a result of that we work with some of the local cat rescue places Um, we've done fundraisers for um, oh all kinds of stuff like the uh, um Ukrainian refugees, that that sort of thing. Um, Every year we have Hugo's birthday and it becomes this big massive party and sales day. So what we do is we, uh, or uh, Orange Shirt Day um, or Indigenous Peoples Day, we take portions of what we sell and we donate that back to the community. And what we find is the community, as opposed to wanting a 30% off, they are thrilled if we're gonna give 30% to pause or whatever, and they come and they spend way more money than they ever would. So um, that's been a really, really good collaboration for us. It's made us part of the community much quicker than we would have been if we were giving a 30% discount. And it's also uh, a good marketing for um, the the press loves that sort of thing. So we've been getting a lot of um, free press based on on that either um, through traditional press or, or through online. So give your money where it counts. Yeah, that's an awesome idea. Um, Who would like to go next? Chandler, we'll kick it over. Oh, no, we'll kick it over to Chris. (laughs) Um, So we do a number of things. Um, There is a annual uh, short horror film festival that happens at the local theater. Um, So we donate prizes. Um, We hook up authors to talk if they have like a relevant book. Um, And they give us sort of like ad space in front of the movies, which is uh, very fun. And then it's it's genre folks. So it's like in our wheelhouse. Um, We teamed up with the online only uh, romance only bookstore this year. Um, So we ran a festival called Love, Death and Other Words, where we were a book fair that went to different breweries and it was only horror or romance. Um, and that was very fun and they didn't uh, charge us for pop-up space and we got a little bit of advertising but also got to tour around a bit Um, and then we do a thing called spooky marketplace and anyone who does handcrafts that are spooky in nature uh, comes about every other month um, and sets up a table in the bookstore um, and basically runs like a craft fair 
uh, it doesn't cost them anything to do this. It's just like an opportunity for us to connect with other people who like the macabre sort of deal. Yeah. Looks like fun, lots of fun. Okay, Chandler, we'll take it over to you. Yeah, some of some of the stuff that's been really effective for us has been local business partnerships, especially with like breweries and restaurants in town. So we'll do events in their space and try and do even like boozy book clubs and things like that. Uh, especially if you're trying to target like sub 40 year olds for book clubs, um, alcoholic uh, revolved events tend to go a little better. Um, especially we have a couple like really nice local breweries with great spaces that they, they give us. Um, one of the effective things we've done with local businesses is we make them a deal when we do events where they give us their space for free. And in return, we include a drink ticket in the price of the event. Uh, and this has saved us piles of money in, a, in event rental space. Um, and we do it on nights when a lot of the local spaces in town would otherwise be quiet or unbooked. And so it's kind of a win-win. They get business on a night they would otherwise be quiet and we get free space since our store is not actually big enough to, to host events in. The other thing we did a lot of this year uh, that was really helpful was local markets. Muskoka is a hodgepodge of a bunch of different towns, sort of three medium-sized towns, then a lot of very small communities. And none of them have a new bookstore except us in Huntsville. And so whenever we can, we go and do street markets, farmers markets when they'll let us in. And not only do these events tend to actually be pretty great sales events all on their own, people are pretty hyped to see books amongst the carrots and corn, but uh, they also just act as great marketing and a lot of people redirect from those events and actually come and shop uh, in store. So that, that's that been really, really great for us and something I'm hoping to do a lot more of in the coming years. Nana. How, how, what's your experience like in the early days? So, um, I wanted to kind of second what Penny said about um, sort of in-store book fairs for a cause. Those have worked incredibly well. And just, you know, for the economics of it, if you sell more books, you're able to pay more bills, even if you're giving a chunk away off the top. You know, it just, the math works. Um, and um, also uh, noting something that Chris said about neighboring businesses. We used to do in my old neighborhood in Portland, uh, sort of a, an annual crawl where uh, people got a passport from our local Main Street Association to visit the neighborhood independent businesses of all sorts. And just having that many bodies moving through was always good, always helpful. So I'm hoping to maybe help start something like that here in my current neighborhood in Vancouver, where um, there's there are tons of independent businesses on our strip, commercial drive. Um, other than the bookstores, we don't seem to talk to each other all that much. And that could be better and that could be used to our benefit. So I've only been here six months. So I'm the new kid and I don't wanna act like a new broom, but I'm hoping that will, that will come about. That seems like a really good direction to go in. I know you can do it. <laughs> um, our next question is sort of uh, kind of builds on uh, on this uh, marketing uh, question, and I know that we had some really interesting <laughs> stuff come out of it in our uh, first meeting. But uh, let's see uh, what comes up this time. Um, so the question is: Are publishers the best collaborators for bookstores to help bookstores meet their goals, like for instance, promoting diverse? and underrepresented voices? Or are there other partners you look to to help carry out your mission? Um, we've heard the local business piece, but let's let's just uh, delve into that a bit, see where publishers land. Anyone want to start us off or Chandler had his hand up first? So he... 
Um, the short answer for me is no. I rarely find the publishers to be the best collaborator for marketing or diversification. Um, I think the exception to that being small indie Canadian publishers who can be much more helpful, um, especially when you're looking for diverse authors and diverse voices, the small indie publishers, uh, especially the Canadian ones, tend to be quite helpful. The rest of the time, as far as marketing goes, I, I don't think the, the publishers are exactly scions of marketing, but also indies are unfortunately just not their priority. I know for most of the, the sort of big four or five publishers, indies in Canada represent less than 15% of their sales. And so like th that means we're just not the, the top priority for them. And their marketing muscles, frankly, aren't that great either. Um, I find you're better off partnering with specific groups, especially when you're trying to go for diversity. We have a large indigenous population in Muskoka, and we focus a lot of our diversity on indigenous authors. And most of the great book suggestions we get and a lot of the good feedback and help we get comes from local community groups, nonprofits, indigenous organizations, more so than the publishers. I think especially when you're dealing with the big five, their lists are just so large. Your reps have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of books each season. They don't know all of the time. And I think that's reasonable in a sense. It's just not practical for them to. And so I find specific interest groups are actually better at helping with diversity. Um, but I also find they're better at helping with marketing and promotions. We do better when we market with other groups locally. Um, you know, I've had, as I'm sure uh, almost everyone else has, at some point, the major publishers share some of your social posts with this or that. That, that generates, you know, nothing for us really. Um, specific authors can be a much better conduit, but uh, not the big publishers most of the time. We'll pass the baton to Nina. Um, well, Chandler covered a lot of the ground I was going to cover. Um, the my small my small press people are the best about telling me about who's in their list, knowing who's in their list. Um, at choosing to publish authors, authors of color, authors who are queer, authors with more complicated stories. Um, I've been a little bummed really with the the big five lists. You know, I, I came out instantly asking for lists of, you know, queer books and queer authors to feature in my new baby shop. And I got these lists that we're all basically the same book. And, you know, my customers see that, you know, teenagers read a few queer romances in YA and then they're done and they've moved on to something else. And all, you know, I don't need another 50 YA romances. <laughs> I'm sorry, um, that are all the same book. They need to be richer. They need more of a backbone. Um, one standout that I've just read that's coming out next month is um, Skater Boy, just for an example, by Anthony Narada. Um, and it's it's a, a queer YA romance, but it's not just a romance. It's got a backbone of culture. And in this case, it's skater culture. But there's got to be something going on besides just, you know, meet cutes. And that's just one genre. So it's been it's been interesting trying to find the good books in in this mass of really really homogenous ones. Nice. I, I think we'll be able to circle back to some of this too. But um, Chris, you want to um, weigh in? My yeah, my answer is yes and no. Uh, the major publishers, for the most part, are not helpful in terms of uh, marketing us or hooking us up with anything that'll be meaningful. Um, whether it's because we're mostly the queer horror store or I don't know what it is. I'm happy to hear from other people that they have the same experience. Sometimes I suffer from that. I think it's me. Um, <laughs> however, I will say that the independent horror publishers are helpful. 
uh, not only in giving me lists, um, but sharing marketing, sharing ideas, what works for them, what doesn't, um, featuring our store because we are so niche and very much in their wheelhouse and we will have things physically in the store that otherwise they've been only selling online. Um, so that has been very good for us. So yeah, my answer is very much 50-50 yes and no. Like no from the majors, yes from the indies. Um, and anytime I can make a pal with an indie publisher who is passionate about what I'm passionate about, um, any way we can help each other uh, in terms of featuring each other, I'm interested. And anytime I can buy um, extremely like directly from them and cut out distribution and just be like, here's the full breadth of my sale and can you send it directly to me? I do that. Not only does it save me money, but it does put more money directly into their pocket so that they don't have to pay that 30% to someone else. Um, so those relationships are valuable for us both. Thanks. Penny. Yeah, I would say the same as most of them. Um, Lethbridge is um, Southern Alberta. Um, we, we don't have a lot of BIPOC. We don't have a lot of diversity. Um, we do have a huge indigenous population here and we do have a, a very large queer community. So we concentrate on those. Um, I wouldn't say that the, I mean, our, the language that's spoken locally is Blackfoot. So far I've found three books in, in Blackfoot. So uh, we have a big indigenous section, but it, like books that will sell other places in Canada will not sell here. So it's, yeah, it's, it's a learning curve for sure. And the publishers are not helpful in that. It's, it's something that you have to curate as a, as a local store for sure. Great, I think I, I'm, I'm gonna uh, skip to uh, question five on this one, uh, just because it, it seems to fit more naturally, but this is uh, uh, what types of, uh, inefficiencies in your business operations that you think publishers could help with like returns ordering inventory management marketing and promotion like and feel free to talk about your experience uh uh with onboarding as you launch your new spaces um i know that there's some good stories to be shared and uh, learned from there so um how do we want to do this? We'll start with Penny. We'll go reverse order. Penny, Chris, Amy, Chandler. So when we started, it was, so we basically kind of started the whole process in March of 2020. So that was when we were trying to connect with people. And that was the time that you couldn't connect with anybody. So if you phoned Penguin Random House, you got somebody in New Jersey um, so it was really, really tricky to find anybody during that time. So we didn't really have any personal connection outside of book manager. Um, and then of course, book manager got very busy during that time. If any of you guys are on it, you'll know that they onboarded like hundreds and hundreds of stores. So support was not non-existent and I'm sure it was the same for you guys as well. It's just the support isn't there until the reps recognize you and you're up and running and you're good and you don't have, you have no idea what you don't know. So you think, oh, the books are going to come in and we're going to sell them. You forget that you have to order them again the minute they sell and there's the time and all of that. And nobody tells you any of that kind of thing. So I would say that starting a new store now would probably be easier because the reps would help you a little bit. But we didn't have any help at all from any publishers, any anybody at all. So and we didn't see a rep because of our location basically for like two and a half years after the time we opened. So, so it's been, um, I think we've done really well because we've had to like learn everything ourselves and we've had to um, create a space that is different from everybody else's because we've had no, no, um, uh, I guess, preconceived ideas. <laughs> so. Yeah, we'll just go ahead, Chris. 
Um, yeah, I mean, I had a similar experience um, in terms of not really having much help when I when I reached out right away. Once once we were open and reps were visiting, uh, that was easier. But often I found that yeah, I would just have to go to uh, like Ingram and and major distribution chains to buy books because we did not have accounts set up with some of the the Canadian distribution and when I would email no one would get back to me and I was just like I don't care I need these now for the release date um, so there were all sorts of inefficiencies and in ways that uh, my business could have saved money but it, it's not saving money if you don't have the titles to sell so you just got to get them um, what other inefficiencies or sorry i the full length of the question yeah <laughs> yes if there are other uh business operations uh, uh you you see inefficiencies so so aside from your uh your launch your onboarding getting ready uh ongoing are there inefficiencies that you're seeing? Um, I mean, again, for us, like I said, uh, I will often try to get around um, major distro inefficiencies that I see um, by dealing with the publishers directly wherever possible. Luckily, now I have kind of a long list of indie publishers who uh, I can deal with directly, and I'm familiar with their catalogs and their release dates, and they will message me directly to tell me when something's coming and what to expect and I can place my orders that way. It's really cut out a lot of um, uh, time sort of wasted scouring lists that are so long uh, with genres that we don't even cover or want, have any interest in covering. Um, and so uh, I've managed to streamline it, but yeah, it's taken two years. <laughs> Right. Only two years. <laughs> uh, Nina, you've, you've shifted position on me, but you're up next. Oh, weird. <laughs> <It's Zoom>. um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so the two things, one is getting on board with some publishers was easy. There were a couple that were incredibly difficult. Um, it took about six weeks to get from reaching out to getting contact back from a rep with PRH. Um, and that's kind of a stretch. Uh, so that was that was frustrating. And I'm not actually sure I have a rep exactly right now, to be honest. <laughs> um, the, um, the other thing is, there's some information that's just hard to find. And um, in some cases, it used to be easier. How a publisher wants returns handled. Why is that not in a bookseller tab on every website you know make this easy for me you need permission make sure that's up front don't make me call you and ask you or ask three people um this is not information that's difficult to make handy um i find myself kind of missing the days of the old print um uh aba book selling manual because yeah it was print and it was massive but everything was there and there's just, there's no reason why that information can't be available. We have these pocket computers. So it's a frustration. Can I just make a quick comment before Chandler comes on? Um, basically, I, I'll, I'll push the competition and the, and the collaboration, but uh, CBA, Canadian Independent Booksellers Association, if anybody that's on here or is watching it is not a member of CBA, you need to be. Uh, the supplier committees that are, I'm on one of the, the committees, work very, very hard with the publishers to get the indies out there and, and re, uh, create better return policies. The work they have done is truly amazing. And if you're not part of it, then, then you're missing out on a huge education source, which Chandler is going to tell you about in one moment. Uh, yeah, I'll echo. Uh... Penny's comment, uh, SIBA is incredibly helpful. I actually went to a bunch of webinars, much like this one, uh, before opening my store. 
And there was a couple things, specifically consignment, where that one webinar helped me avoid what would have otherwise been a disaster in consignment. So I was deeply appreciative of that. Um, I it, Everyone's kind of covered the train wreck that is onboarding. So I'm going to say a couple of different things. One, I think the single biggest inefficiency from the publishers that hampers us is just order speed. Um, it just takes way, way too long to get books. In a small town, we're lucky that most of our customers want to shop local, are very attentive to it, and are patient. But for every customer we see in the store who is patient and wants to support us, there are many that we don't see who just want their book quickly. And it is so difficult to explain to a customer that Amazon can get you a book tomorrow, but it's going to take me, someone with a direct relationship with the publisher, three weeks to get it to you. Um, and and that just seems insane to me. I have uh, argued with many of the publishers. The fact that Raincoast can turn around a book in 24 hours means all of them should be able to as well. Um, the fact that Amazon can fulfill way more book orders on a daily basis than any one publisher and they can do it in under 24 hours, again, means the publishers should be able to. If we could get books in under five business days, um, everyone who has Raincoast on the West Coast, very lucky uh, with Book Express. But if we could get books in under five business days, I actually think that would be one of the most dramatic shifts to our business and our ability to compete and sell. So that's one. The second inefficiency I would point out, you know, we're talking a lot about the difficulty of onboarding with the publishers, but I also think it has to be mentioned that we effectively have a book selling POS monopoly in Canada. Um, and that that's not to disparage book manager in any way. I know they do lots of great things, but it now takes two years to get onboarded basically. And there are no real viable alternatives and that creates a huge bottleneck for people trying to open stores or trying to get into this space. Um, I think uh, it would be great to see Book Manager get serious about killing that backlog. Um, but in absence of that, and, and even without, I do think we really need a viable alternative. I don't think it's ever a benefit to an industry to only have one available tool. I think it kills creativity, optionality. Um, so I, I think that creates a big inefficiency as well. And I would love to see some like real strong alternatives that that people could use that stores could get onboarded with more quickly. And I think part of this even comes down to, um, you know, a lot of publishers now when they send out lists, they only send them in book manager format half the time. And so for anyone not using Book Manager, which we're not on Book Manager, we have to message some of our reps sometimes and say like, hey, like we can't open these lists. Can you send them to us in Catalyst? Um, so, yeah. If it's any consolation, even when they send them to us in Book Manager, we can't open them. So. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> There you go. It's good to know we're all struggling with the same thing. Um, yeah. I'd also like to say re uh, shipping times. I can tell you as a publisher looking for distro, um, the amount that they charge you as a publisher to hold your books and supposedly streamline this process is astronomical for them to then take three weeks to get someone a book. Very good uh long lingering problems <laughs> um <clears throat> and i'm glad to see fresh blood being you know thrown at the problem is that a good metaphor probably not anyways um <clears throat> see but blood yeah throwing is perfect for blood us. throwing for yeah. chris yes lots of blood <laughs> uh the seba yeah we we endured quite uh, time there without the CBA in Canada, big gaps trying to be filled. We're really happy to see the CBA, you know, taking on a lot of the things that went missing. Um, <clears throat> let's see, I'm going to move on now because uh, the shipping time obviously lends itself to questions of competition. So uh, I'll ask the question about competition. Who 
Do you think your competition is in the book selling space? How do you compete with them? And how might publishers support independent bookstores to level the playing field in competition? Nina has her hand up right away. Uh, I have I have so many feelings about this. Um, even though I'm in a neighborhood with five other bookstores, my competition is still Amazon. You know, there's not I, I have a very different product mix from my neighbors. And we we actually we complement each other, I think, really well. And we're fairly collegial. Um, the uh, when I see an author um, begging for people to tell their bookstores about them and you know that kind of thing. And then I go to their website and the only options I see on their page for ordering are Amazon and Indigo. Then I know that I'm not important to them. And I also know that I'm not important to their publisher. And I know their publisher is not telling them, hey, you need to think about indies. Yeah, we're 15% of the market. Well, there's a reason for that. Okay, we've been just ignored. And, you know, I'm, I'm preparing to host an author right now who I'm very excited about, and their team is lovely. But um, when I go to their website, um, even though they've booked with multiple independent bookstores for their upcoming tour, there is no independent option on their website. None of us are featured. It's all Amazon and the chains for Canada. And um, part of that is that we don't have something unified and easy to put up like Bookshop uh, in the U.S. But part of it is just that they don't even think about us until we make them. And I think we could really use some help with that. It's, I was at an offsite event over the weekend, and um, one of the one of the customers was like, "So you're from Amazon, right?" You know, and that's not the first time that's happened. And I get people walking in my store, and this happened in my old shop in Portland too. Hey, um, so do you get all these books from Amazon? You know, and that's that's been a constant, and it's still an issue. And Amazon is also our competitor for speed. If I can't get it from Raincoast, there's a chance I'll lose that sale. I jump in there. Um, two comments. One, uh, not to keep pumping uh, SIBA, but they are building IndieBookstores.ca, which would be the um, bookshop.org equivalent. Uh, you don't have to be a SIBA member to have your store listed. Um, you do, however, have to be a book manager customer for it to actually show your inventory and link directly to you. So that's a that's a separate thing. Um, but so if you are looking for a bookshop.org equivalent, uh, SIBA has been working really hard on getting a, a Canadian one up. Um, the uh, the other thing I was going to tack on to, I think obviously, yes, Amazon is a huge portion of, I think, everyone's competition. Uh, the other one that surprised me a little is ours is like Shoppers Drug Mart and Loblaws. Um, they don't carry a lot of titles, but they carry the best sellers and they carry them 30% off. Uh, I think the, the biggest way the publishers could help, and I doubtful this would ever happen, but on the bestseller titles that all of the big stores like Amazon, Barnes Noble, Indigo have automatically listed at 25 to 30% off. If the publishers created some sort of like automatic shared markdown for indies on those titles, I would cut a little bit of my margin to be able to give a 30% discount or a 25% discount on the top 50 bestsellers in our store and be more price competitive because the reason that the large bookstores do it is a loss leader, right? It gets people in the door. And I would love to have a handful of titles where we could do that. And so instead of going to shoppers, people go, oh, well, I know that, you know, the new Nora Roberts, whatever it is, will be at Cedar Canoe Books, also 25% off. And they come here and then they buy four other things. Um, but we don't, as I think everyone here knows, as an indie, we don't have the margin ourselves to take that hit as a loss leader and just hope that people buy more stuff. But I do think the publishers could more adeptly enable us to do that. At least the big ones. I wouldn't ask indie publishers to do that. But again, most of these like hot bestsellers that are 30% off are unfortunately also not coming from indie publishers. They're coming from the big five. If I could jump back in for a sec. I think what I'm really asking of publishers here is um, when they onboard authors, 
And when they help uh, put together marketing campaigns or they instruct authors on what to have on their website, um, that they make sure that if you're booking for an appearance at an independent bookstore, that independent bookstore is linked and featured and people are gonna be buying that book from that indie um, because it is painful to have people walk in my store with books they got on Amazon, you know, and say, hey, I'm here to get this signed. Chris or Penny, you wanna add anything here? Um, yeah, I mean, like I, I will second that Amazon emotion. Um, <laughs> uh just because especially for us uh with a lot of uh indie titles um people don't realize that a lot of indie publishers now have moved to actually printing through kdp so there's no way for me to buy that without touching amazon which i won't do um so people look for books with us that are indie presses that I don't carry because I can't because I won't shop on Amazon to stock the store that seems insane um <laughs> and uh and or they're printing with Ingram which I will deal with and do the print on demand and, and get it shipped here but it does cost more and then I can't price match um so again that's where I step in and deal with the publisher directly um but yeah it's uh it's not so much what the publishers can do for me to help me compete with amazon it's what canada post can do for me to make me able to compete with amazon because free shipping is a lie um there is no way to ship affordably in canada um <laughs> we don't have media mail uh, which is something the U.S. has uh, to make book shipping a little bit cheaper. Um, it is just so expensive to send anything, and the small business discount through Canada Post is a joke. So sometimes it is just that, well, someone wants to support uh, the indie horror bookstore, um, they simply cannot because it costs so much to ship to them so they just hit the button that doesn't cost them an extra twenty dollars um i don't i have a lot of comments on this one because um we probably are competing with amazon i mean that's just the real world um, we also have a chapters um, within two blocks from us. Chapters has actually been really good for us because they don't order in their store. So when people say, well, what am I going to do? They'll send them over to us. So we actually have chapters actively sending us customers. Um, my only sort of recommendation would be to curate your, and it sounds like, like you guys do, but curate your stock to not need to ha have the best sellers because what people love about our store is when they come in, they're like, wow, I see these books that I don't see other places. So, you know, we don't ever sell a hardcover new mystery or romance. We don't even bother bringing it in. We don't have a single James Patterson in the store, which I know Chandler, you need to, but we don't. So like, we're not competing with, with, uh, Superstore and Costco and all of that. If they carry it, we don't even bother to carry it. But then that allows us self shelf space to bring in, you know, a 20 year old John Irving that will sell. So, so I, I, I guess it's all about curation for us. So. Tim, can I jump in here one more time? Just two really quick uh, final comments on this. Uh, and Chris, I think you kind of mentioned this as well, but independently published books, while phenomenal for the authors, and it's great to, to see that taking off. And I don't mean like your local Joe down the street who like Amazon published something. I mean like true independently published major works. While fantastic are nearly impossible for us to get, and often even they are net zero on Ingram. Um, and so there is an asymmetry in the industry there that I, I still think needs to be sorted out. The other thing is I would kill for someone to start a Libro FM, but for eBooks, um, you know, it, uh, almost a quarter of the book industry is now eBooks and it is actually not possible for indies to compete in that space. And much like a lot of our customers happily drop their Audible subscriptions and, and grab Libro. Um, I know if we had an eBook option, 
many of our customers would happily drop their Kindle or Kobos and switch to that. Um, but indies are effectively locked out of what is now a quarter of the book consumption market um, because we just don't have a way to sell ebooks. And I don't think ebooks are going to take over, but automatically excluding a, a quarter of the market right off the bat already, I think, is really disadvantageous. Um, so if anyone here is a good coder and wants to to on the side open the the Libro FM of of ebooks, I would be forever in your debt and so thrilled. I mean, on that topic, again, from the from the publishing end of the world, I can tell you that um, Amazon, if you um, if you list an ebook somewhere other than Amazon, they won't take your your Kindle book. Um, so you can't list in two places that this is how they've, uh, you know, killed us all. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and because, uh, for our publications, we obviously don't do that. We have the eBooks directly through our website. Um, they won't look at us and there will never be a Kindle option, uh, for us. So eBooks in general are something that has to change and be looked at as as like an industry thing for the publishers as well because this is not this is not helping them by having to basically give 30 percent of those to amazon just right away like yeah that is a huge problem um i'm going to actually we have five minutes oh, four minutes left so I'm going to open it up to our uh, panel for our audience questions. Yeah, someone's telling me to do that already. So. <laughs> Doing the right thing. Okay, so this is for everybody. First question, have you noticed the current economic environment having an impact on how much people are spending on books? We'll just go quickly. Around. I would really quickly say no. Um, I'm sure on a macro level, it will have some impact, but books are for most people a luxury item. Um, and if you're super price conscious, you're probably shopping Amazon or eBooks anyways. Um, so I find our buyer at least is like someone who's already comfortable paying a higher ticket price for a book um, and maybe is a little less economically sensitive. We also may be in a weird spot because Muskoka uh, is a mix of being quite wealthy. So mm -hmm. In that's that. true <laughs> that's true chris i, I would echo chandler oh, okay. in, in the that people are still buying the books and they're still supporting local what i find is that they're coming twice now to do it i feel like it's kind of like cutting the donut in half and then eating both sides of it they might come and buy one book but then they'll show up three days later and buy the second one that they were thinking about oh that's a good observation it's uh, yeah, I mean, I find that people either are um, saving it up and then doing a big one, like, you know, doing a big shop, or they're they're cutting the donut. So, like, I notice I either see people less often or more often, depending on their, uh, <laughs> their proximity to the store or their appetite for online shopping. Uh, so the people who are buying books are still buying books. Yeah. Nina, do you have anything? I can ask the next question. I think you're muted. I'm, I think I'm, I'm a little too new to really have a strong feel, although I do, I do have people who come in one time and buy a book to come in the next time and apologize for not buying a book yet. <laughs> they're so cute. Um, well uh, but they do they do mention their their paycheck. And you know, <laughs> things are tight and oh the rental market in bank. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. Gotta gotta eat, put a roof over your head. And then read. Um Okay, what are the costs associated with running bookstores that people might not necessarily think of, aside from rent, the cost of orders, et cetera? Anything, uh, what do some of those expenses look like? I would say time and that you don't get to read books anymore because you're too busy running your store. Everyone thinks we stand around all day and read books. I, I read way more books before I was a bookseller. 
<laughs> yeah, it's true. It's true. Myth busting right here. <laughs> um, I would just quickly say association fees. There's a lot more associations I'm a part of and pay a fee to than I expected. Um, and it's all the like random tools, like email tools and stuff like that, that you don't, you don't think about, um, email's not that random, but there are more obscure ones <laughs> for whatever reason we've ended up paying for, uh, that kind of stuff are the, the biggest surprises. And printing, okay. budget to do a lot of printing. Mm -hmm. Um, taxes, plan ahead, have a savings account for your sales taxes. Um, I, I had done bookkeeping for a, another small business for a little while. So I was forewarned about this. My old, my old state in, in the U.S. didn't have sales tax. Um, but, uh, I think that's something that can creep up on people if you don't, if you don't really think about it. And then, you know, you get to the end of the quarter and you have about $2,000. And so know that that's coming. Inventory is effectively profit until you sell it. So wait for the first tax bill and all the inventory you have sitting in your store. Um, okay, well, we are at 301. Let's do a rapid fire question here, everybody. What is the average number of books sold per day in your store? We'll go alphabetically. Uh, Chandler. <laughs> um off season for us like 30 to 100 really varies um on season so summer or christmas um 200 to 350 a day uh during peak season it really we're very very seasonal swingy so it really depends yes uh we're seasonal swingy in a different way uh i mean uh, october yeah, 400. <laughs> Every other time, yeah, about 100. Nina. January? Um, <laughs> uh, right now, it's like maybe honestly about 15 books a day, which is like, wow, it's January. And then in December, <laughs> it was more like 150. So it's pretty wide swing. Mm -hmm. And we're still new. We're just a baby. So, I mean, we show growth pretty much every month. Okay. And Penny, last word. Yeah, all over the place. I would say anywhere from 50 to 500, depending on, on the day and the time of year. Um, we count transactions and our transactions pretty much stay at around 50 a day um, for small, like regular days. And then on, on big days, jump up to like a hundred on weekends kind of idea more than, than individual books. So. Yeah. And if you're a publisher, you can get some of this data in BNC sales data. If you have uh, publisher views turned on and the retailers are contributing data. So you can see that what the average sales are. Um, I just want to thank you so much, Chris, Nina, Chandler, and Penny for joining us today. Before we go, we'd love it if you could provide feedback on this session. We'll drop a link to the survey in the chat. Please take a couple of minutes to fill it out. We'll also be emailing you a link to a recording of this session as soon as it's available. To our attendees, we invite you to join our upcoming session Trending Now, Book Subjects on the Move in the Canadian Market, scheduled for February 27th. Additionally, we have early bird tickets available for our upcoming Onyx and Thema training. Learn more about these upcoming events and register through the link we'll be dropping in the chat. Find information about all upcoming sessions and recordings of previous sessions on our website, bnctechforum.ca. Lastly, we'd like to thank the Department of Canadian Heritage for their support through the Canada Book Fund, and thanks to you all for attending. Thank you so much. It's great to see you again. Good luck selling. <laughs>